I grew up in uh, Rock Hill, and I grew up in a Catholic church, and the order of priests that were assigned to our uh, the Catholic church, St. Anne, they were of the order of St. Uh, Philip, and they lived in the oratory. The oratory was a, a small um, facility. It had housing. It had some fellowship spaces for these men to live in. I can remember Father William. I was in third grade, and he took me aside one day, and it, we just were chatting, and he said, John, um, I think you'd make a great priest when you get older. It terrified me. Um, I wasn't really worried about the idea of not getting married at age eight. That wasn't of real concern to me. <laughs> but it was that clerical collar. I remember to this day, I still struggle with things being a bit too tight around my neck. But the, the real story, though, is when he said that, it did... There was something inspiring about that word into my life. While there were certainly problems within the church and within uh, the priest, I would argue that two of the greatest heroic acts in our city took place through this church. The first was actually the school that I attended. In 1954, St. Anne's School was the first integrated school in the whole state of South Carolina. This caused many problems in our city. And namely, that the, eventually the Ku Klux Klan came to the very school where I was and burned a cross right in the center of it. The little nuns and the priests that were there, they watched this take place. They just carried on believing that this was, in fact, the right thing to do. The second story took place maybe 20 years later. Just after the uh, Vietnam War was nearing an end, many in South Vietnam were in a place at risk because as the troops left, they were vulnerable to those uh, local militants. And there was a desire to take some of those in South Vietnam and to move them to safe places, America being one of those places. Well, I read of a woman named Mary Vu. One morning, she was cooking breakfast in her house just as she had always done. And her husband rushed into the front door and said, we have to go. And so she grabbed her young daughter, who was 16 months old, and began running down the streets. Somewhere along the way, she lost her shoes. She lost her luggage. She lost everything that she had ever known in life, and she was transported all the way to the United States. Well, it was actually these, those at the oratory who learned of these circumstances, and in Rock Hill and began to establish a, they found a home for her and her larger family, and many others for that matter. And they incorporated them into the life of the church and into the community. I graduated with a class of 400, I'd say. And I would argue, I would guess anyway, that every single one of those students who came from South Vietnam, it, was a, it ended up being a large uh, family and many other families that came, I would say they all probably finished in the top 10% of the class. They not only came into our community, but they were achievers in the community. This day, they're leaving still a mark. Mary Vu said that uh, when she got to the U.S., there was a Father Joseph um, who was there greeting her. And he said, she remembered, he just kept talking. And I had no idea what he was saying, but he was smiling and I just felt more comfortable. So there's a spectrum, right, in terms of, uh, of what this word means when we begin to say it. Uh, but with this spectrum, I think that there's, this quote adequately summarizes the real danger of this priest. When the ordained priest comes to be seen as categorically different from and highly elevated above the common believer, it's no wonder that falls from grace amount to catastrophes. Well, that's one problem with the word priest. There's another problem that's brought out, and it's the word all. Priesthood of all believers, that everyone is, in fact, a priest. What can happen here under the guise of a conscience or under um, the idea that there can be an unfettered individualism and schisms that can begin to take place if we're all priest, and we all have the same voice in terms of how the church should run and what it should look like. You don't really have to look beyond our own history in the American Presbyterian Church to see 
that there are often times where we simply just disagree. And many of these separations or, and splits may have been needed, but I would bet, wonder if some of them were not just uh, people who just didn't like the way things were going and got their bags and just said, let's go do this in a different place. Here's a quote I think that summarizes. We're confronted with two potential priesthood problems. Clerical priesthood and the individualistic priesthood. The former sometimes manifests itself in unhealthy hierarchy. The latter in unfettered democracy. And neither is desirable. So there's, here we have Martin Luther. We just said earlier that one of the things he's trying to salvage is this idea of universal priesthood of believers and the importance of it and that we, in fact, are to be the messengers. Well, what was he trying to salvage in the first place? Well, to help us understand this, I'm going to scroll back one more time in history and look at Cyprian. It was around 200 A.D. It was a, a bishop in Carthage. And during this time, if you were to have uh, been with him, and we'd have asked you, what's the importance of having bishops and people of power within the church? He would offer this as one of the explanations, the idea of unity. During this time, as persecution was breaking out around them, it was very important for this small but growing church to have a sense that we're together, to have some sense of continuity. And one of the ways you uh, bring about continuity is to have people who are in leadership, who are controlling, the, who are uh, guarding the doctrines and the orthodoxy. So they needed to have people who understood what, in fact, the church believed to. The second thing that happened during his time as well is that bishops and the clergy began to move more and more uh, into positions of authority. Uh, they began to be the people who, when it was time, to, when it was to administer baptisms, uh, confirmation, uh, the Lord's Supper, these would be the people who were placed in that position. Uh, there, when debates would come out during some of the persecutions, uh, there would be people who left the church who, when it goes, they were pressed to say, uh, believe or don't believe, and if you don't believe, then if you do believe, you're going to be persecuted. And they just said, well, then I'm just going to walk away. Well, eventually they came back. Well, should we reinstate them, or should they be excommunicated? And like any church, some people are going to be a bit more rigid and say, excommunicate them. That's what you do to people when they fail. Other people would have been a bit more sympathetic. Well, I think we should actually reinstate, uh, reinstate them after they have some statement of confession. Well, it was through at this particular point that the church, the only people who could begin to reinstate those who had fallen away it was the bishops. And they began to say that we're the ones, it's the church itself that can determine whether or not someone should be in our uh, fellowship or not. And finally, there was a, a shift and change of the purity. Uh, the ordination of the priest, it was beginning, people were beginning to see that what took place during that process was this indelible mark was placed upon them. During this time, it was often the case that when they were being anointed, that oil was, in fact, poured over their hands. And they were seen as those people who hold and consecrate the sacraments, that they have holy hands and they are to be completely set apart. So what was growing was the separation between the common and the clergy. Fast forward now to 1073 with Gregory VII. What took place under his, uh, during his time was uh, who has the power exactly to anoint or to invest clergy? Because at the time there was discussion, well, who could do that? Is it the state or is it just the church that can do that? And it, uh, during this time it was, it was seen as just the clergy are those that are able to do that. There again, there was a more and more of a rise to power. And finally, in 1493, we're now getting very close to Martin Luther, uh, Pope Eugene IV, said this, Among these sacraments there are three, baptism, confirmation, and ordination, which imprint an indelible sign on the soul, that is, a certain character distinctive of others. 
So a rift was beginning to take place in the church more and more. And this is what Luther began to argue. His argument was, A, it's not in Scripture. B, it elevates the ordained. It creates separation. And it denies the idea of universal priesthood. You know, he was in a really tough place to make an argument because the argument that would come back to him would be, well... um, Unfortunately, the only person that can interpret Scripture is the Pope, so you don't really have much of a stance there. And then the argument would be, well, let's get together. Let's have a council to discuss these matters. Well, the only person that can pull together a council is the Pope himself. And so he found himself in this circular argument that the church could not correct herself on this matter. In fact, he thought that the church was being held captive. A book he wrote, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, he said this, They've sought by ordination to set up a seedbed of implacable discord by which clergy and laymen should be separated from each other further, farther than heaven and earth. They not only exalt themselves above, above the rest of the Christians who are only anointed with the Holy Spirit, but regard them almost as dogs and unworthy to be included with themselves in the church. Luther, in his arguments as to, if you were to summarize his arguments as to why he believed in this universal priesthood of all believers, there's three stranded argument, I think. The first one was this, is that he tied together, he looked at Christ's royal priesthood, And he said that our royal priesthood, for those who are in Christ, is intrinsically connected to that. We are royal priests because Christ was royal priest. The second thing he looked at was this New Testament commitment. He uh, began to see the text where over and over this theme was brought together. And uh, the third argument, this is probably the most important one, I think, um, in terms of just evangelism, which I will get to, is that uh, he looked at these Old Testament practices of the priest, and he said that those practices are our practices. He went on to, in the book Representing Christ, these two authors lay out all these practices. They spend several chapters looking at those. I'm just going to say this about them. You can summarize them, the practices, what are the practices of the royal priesthood? The authors make the case that they can be summarized by worship and work, but central to the practice of the royal priesthood, it's that we're to be witnesses in this world. 1 Peter 2.9 says that very thing, this royal priesthood, this holy nation, And what's central to what that is? That you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness. There's a sentence in this book that really stood out to me. It says, A faithful performance of the practice of proclamation cannot separate word and deed. So it's saying central to this practice of proclamation, it's word and deed. All right, quick summary. Here's all I've said so far. Reformation was not only about the recovery of a message, but the recovery of who are the messengers. That's us. We are the royal priests who are called to proclaim the good news. In this proclamation, it's always done with word and deed. I highlight those two words, word and deed, because at times maybe this is what we think of how they coexist with one another. Um, I think this comes from the show Frenemies. I've never seen that before, but I think that's somewhere. And it's as if the word and deed are, they were connected, but we really don't like being connected. 
Um, the idea that maybe they, they exist like two jealous siblings in a church. And one says, I wonder if I'm getting more attention. Like, does it, we really encourage evangelism? Or the other one's saying, I hope I'm in a church that really encourages good deeds. And often, there's just a tension between the two of these as to how they exist. Where did that come from? Well, in many ways, it has only come about, well, I'll say this, it's in more recent history, it's come about, some trace it back to the 1800s in America, at least, with Washington Gladden. Washington Gladden wrote a book that was essentially trying to encourage people in the industrial age, particularly the managers and the leaders in there, to bring about some of the Christian principles that they had within them into the work. And so there were people who, as they read through that material, considered it, essentially said, uh, Mr. Gladden, uh, we appreciate what you're saying, but you really need to take your message, uh, let, go back to the church with it, and focus on salvation, personal salvation. That's what your message needs to be as the priest. This whole idea that you're going to take this message and carry it over into the to work and all the implications that are there, that probably goes beyond the scope of what you need to be doing. Get, instead of, you need to get back in the business of saving souls and kind of staying out of these other areas. And uh, Sean Lucas connects this story more closely with the uh, Presbyterian Church with this gentleman here, Walter Lingle. Uh, Mr. Lingle had a serendipitous moment at the Carnegie Library one day. He was uh, thumbing, he's a professor at Union Theological Seminary, I think he's a president of Davidson, uh, same as Steph Curry, but um, he, um, he was reading one afternoon, he had this moment where he came across um, this gentleman here's writing. And Walter Rauschenbusch, and as he was reading it, he began to see that this writing was placing a needed emphasis on social reform in the church. He contended this, that the spread of the kingdom of God is not going to come through fire and brimstorm, um, fire and brimstorm teaching, but by leading a life that reflects Christ. Jesus, he said, did not substitute um, his life for atonement of sin as much as it was he substituted love for selfishness, and this should become the basis of human society. Well, this caused problems in the church because the proclamation of the good news began in many ways to be replaced with social reform that was taking place in the society. Lingle was demonstrating that the Southern Presbyterian commitment to the spiritual mission of the church had unnecessarily and unbiblically limited it to matters of individual salvation, and he opposed that. By the 1960s, conservatives were convinced that the church's failure to maintain their historic evangelistic approach, which had been traded in for evangelism as social justice, had led to the gross moral and social failures of this rising generation. Conservatives wondered whether the apocalypse was truly coming in their times. If so, it was the fault of the progressives and the transformation of the mission of the church. You can feel the tension there. The church in the 60s was wanting to protect the message of the gospel, the proclamation of the good news. And there were others who saw what needed to have changes that the church had become too insular and wanted to reach out and to do some good things, but they did so at the cost, some would argue, and it did take place at this time at the cost of the gospel. This kind of became personal to me several years ago at the General Assembly. If we could span the picture out, you could actually see me. I'm right behind 
Uh, this is James Baird, and George Robertson is right next to me. James Baird took the microphone during the General Assembly when we were debating the racial reconciliation overture. And it had been going on for a very long, the debate had been going on for a long time, and eventually Dr. Baird stood up. And he said this, in 1971, 12 men were elected to form a new denomination. All have died or left the PCA except two, Kennedy Smart and me. And I confess that in 1973, the only thing I understood was that we were starting a new denomination, which we did. And I confess that I did not raise a finger for civil rights. I thought I was to do one thing, and that was to start a new denomination for the sake of Scripture, for the sake of the preservation of historic Presbyterianism, and for the furtherance of the gospel proclamation. And in that statement, that gospel proclamation to me, I saw freshly the tension that we as the church can have. What I think he's saying is that we were so focused on this particular goal of gospel proclamation, of fighting against theological liberalism in the church, that we just missed it as we looked at the world around us. And that's what, in fact, he's confessing. You see, the church has a problem with word and deed. Often we bounce back and forth from one from the other, when in fact, we're called to do both. Another story I read about was John Stott and Billy Graham. At one point, they gathered together with nearly 2,500 evangelicals from around the world, representing 150 countries, 135 denominations. They were in Switzerland. They wanted to put this contract together. I mean, I guess the nearest thing would be the, the gospel coalition of their day. And as they began to get together, they were putting the finishing touches, you could say, on this covenant that they all were going to embrace. Well, a problem happened. Billy Graham, who was essentially bankrolling the whole event, uh, came together with all these leaders, and he was presenting uh, what he wanted the essence of the covenant to be. He said, what I counsel, he said, is that we stick strictly to evangelism and missions, while at the same time encouraging others to do the specialized work that God has commissioned the church to do. That specialized work was works of deeds, including other things. But that was the emphasis. Uh, John Stott, um, who was the other uh, large figure, evangelical figure in the room, he went to bed that night and he said he, he, he was up all night wrestling as to what to do. He came back the next day and he t informed those who were there that I, I cannot sign this. And there were many who were others in there who were sympathetic to those, mainly those in other countries as well. Because at the time, America was so responding to the theological liberalism that was there that there was this emphasis, a needed emphasis, on the proclamation of the word. Well, they became, uh, there was a debate that took place. And Billy Graham, who often was the better person in these situations, he took Stott and one other person in the room. He said, you all go to this room and figure it out. Don't come out until we have a compromise here. And they eventually came up with a particular compromise. But again, you can feel it, right? There's this, this tension between word and deed in our church and what it looks like. Some have appropriately given this image. They said that when evangelism and, uh, I guess you could say, proclamation of word and proclamation of deed we should see them as two wings of a bird. Others have said that the better, another way to describe them would be two blades of a pair of scissors. 
Others say you don't have to go any further than the Bible just to say that the two opposites in the church, one is focused on word, one is focused on deed, and that is, in fact, our priority. The problem is, is that within the church, we tend to emphasize one at the cost of others. For those who are sympathetic, more to, and want to, want to emphasize, churches that want to emphasize the proclamation of the word, when they read church like this, right, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. That can be a bit, um, that can cause unrest. Because if you never use words, then the only thing you may be pointing to is yourself, that you do great things. But others who would say, well, we need to emphasize deeds, they look to uh, perhaps this book by Craig Lomberg, who in his book, he essentially at, at some point accounts how much emphasis is given to the Bible on caring for the poor, but how little emphasis is really ever given in the preaching of pastors around the country. And so again, there's this tension that exists between the two. In a journal that's put out by Gospel Coalition, three ideas, and I'll conclude um, with where we're going with this series. They say, here's something to keep in mind as we as a church work through these issues. First of all, if you come to our church long enough, we always say this at the beginning of everything, that everything we're ever to do, it must begin with a response to grace. In our proclamation, word and deed, it's rooted in a response to grace. The second thing is that as we think about word and deed, that they're distinct and inseparable. And finally, I just will say this, and I thought this was very helpful, but that evangelism has a priority. I go on to say this. We're not referring to an invariable temporal priority because in some situations, a social ministry will take precedence but to a logical one. What they're saying there is there's times where it makes more sense to begin with uh, deeds, with works in a particular situation. Um, but the logical priority is with evangelism. The very fact, that of, uh, the very fact of Christian social responsibility presupposes socially responsible Christians. And it can only be evangelism and discipling that they have become such. What it's saying is that with our ministry of deeds, the people who are to do the ministry of deeds are people who have been born again, who are those who have been evangelized, those who have been discipled and want to move in that direction. So with that in mind, there's a priority that exists with evangelism. And then they would say this, of all the tragic needs of human beings, none is greater than their alienation from their Creator and the terrible reality of eternal death for those who refuse to repent and believe. I read um, the story of this film director here who produced um, Driving Miss Daisy, Bruce Beresford. He was one of Australia's most um, known directors of films, and he also directed a film entitled The Black Robe. It was the story of missionaries who uh, went into Canada to reach the, the lands there. And they, someone asked him, they said, what was the most difficult part of the movie, of directing it? They said, well, was it the weather? We heard no Canada weather. That's awful to, to have to produce a, direct a movie in that type of cold. He said, no. He said, well, was it uh, you were having a difficult time keeping the historical um, clarity true as to what took place? Was that really the hard part of directing the film? He said, no, that wasn't the hard part of directing the film either. He said the hard part of directing the film was that it was difficult for, to believe. He wanted to make the person, the evangelist, the pastor believable. He said this, he had an obsession with getting people into heaven. This is a concept few people these days take seriously. And my job was to convince an audience that this is important. 
think that's true. As I look out, as I just was, anytime I teach on the idea of evangelism, I pass by so many people who are so more gifted at this than I am. I am ashamed often at this area of my life. But the point here is that what we want to become is a church that who is convinced of the importance of this in our lives. It's a concept that many don't take seriously today. Reformation was not only about the recovery of a message, but also its messengers. We are the messengers. God has given that to us. Royal priests, when we look at our functions as the priest, at the center of these responsibilities we have, we are to proclaim the good news. Faithful proclamation that can never be separated into word and deed. They're inseparable. They're distinct. But I think if you're anything like me, one's a bit more difficult than the other. So we're going to take this summer and we're going to look at evangelism. Here's the plan. Next week, Matt Bradner is going to be with us. Uh, Matt is going to help us think through what to say and when to say it. So he's going to just think through the idea of when some words, when do we use our words to proclaim the good news to those around us. The week after that, Drew Warner from Perimeter Church will help us to think how do we become these messengers where we live, where we work, and where we play. Finally, Mike Heron on July 23rd will talk through just the power in evangelism, uh, the prayer and the process of that. July 3rd, we have a panel as well just to kind of talk through what this looks like um, as well in our lives and the life of our church. Uh, let me pray for us as we end our time. Father, we do thank you. And we, as we look at the life of our church, as we look at history, it seems that we tend to bounce from one side to the other between word and deed. We often reject the idea that we, in fact, are your royal priests and we have been given divine dignity. The core of who we are as these royal priests is to be messengers of that which you've done in this world. Father, it can be intimidating to live with this reality. Father, many of us, it's often easier to be involved in the proclamation of deeds, but the proclamation of words, we either are, are inadequate for it or we're insecure about who we are that we would hate to even bring up these matters and conversations. So Lord, we do just ask that in this month that we would be a people who um, learn more and more as to what it means to be people who live with real news that's good news. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.